We want to thank everybody for being here with us tonight. Thank everybody that joins us by means of social media, YouTube, Facebook, and every other electronic avenue. Praise God. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, you can go to our website, nhmcentraldenver.org, and click the Give tab and sow into the ministry a dollar, a thousand, whatever, a million. It all helps in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight as I speak, um, you know, I'm going to give you a quick lesson in Greek. Sometimes I come in as a teacher and I just, I, I, I take the word and I give it and, and it's very straightforward and it's in, in, a, in, a, in an educational manner. And other times the minister, myself or whoever else will come in more as a preacher or even an evangelistic or with a prophetic anointing on the word. And, and, it, and here's the thing. In Greek there are two words that talk about time. One is chronos, which is like, and this doesn't have a whole lot, but I just want to, I want you to see where I'm coming from here. So chronos is where we get our English word chronological, which means at a set time, in a set point in time. And so there's chronos time in the Greek, but the other time is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is the kairos time. So to help you understand this chronos time, is just like when the Rockies start the game at 2 p.m., 6 p.m. That's chronos time. That's something that is set to happen at a certain time, at a certain season, that is very straightforward, that is understood, that, that, that we can discern most of the time, even naturally. That's that chronological or chronos time in the Greek. And a lot of times the teaching... Um, when we're teaching, our, our teachings come in that, in that chronological order, in that chronos time, not necessarily um, from history or whatever, but that's just the way it's laid out. But every so often, as should happen in a spirit-filled church, the Lord will bring in, and most often it's with evangelists and, and, and prophetic men and women that are guests, but sometimes I get the pleasure. And the Lord will drop that Kairos word. And so I told you, I used that example that Kronos is that 2 p.m. start time that the Rockies have. You know that they're going to start at 2 p.m.-ish, right? <clears throat> but that Kairos time is when the Rockies are getting beat. And things are getting rough for them. And the only thing that's going to that, that, that's gonna change if, is if they get a morale booster. And then whoever comes up to the plate and, and just the perfect pitch is called and the perfect pitch is thrown and he swings that bat at the perfect time and that bat meets that ball at the perfect time and bam, it's a home run and it changes the whole outlook of the game. Like it don't matter. You've known for weeks and months that that game started at 2 o'clock. But it was at an appointed time that that ball met that bat and went off and changed the whole outlook and outcome of what things. So do you get the difference between Kronos time and Kairos time? Do you, do you get that? Does everyone? I, I'm not a big Greek scholar or nothing. But it excites me when I can share a Kairos word. Because it tells me that God is doing something. He's bringing some correction for a reason. And with that, I, very, I don't always get to share a Kairos word, especially in my own church. I usually get it when I get to go somewhere else or share it with someone else. But this Kairos word is for tonight, for an appointed time. It is true at any time, but there is some reason that God has dropped this from, from the throne room of heaven into my heart, into this Thursday evening service, so that the bat can meet the ball at a certain time and bring about some real change, some real correction and Instruction and understanding so they can change the outlook and the way everything goes looks from this point forward. Are you with me tonight? <clears throat> Do you understand why I told you now about Kronos and Kairos? Because this is one of those times. Tonight we're very simply going to go to the book of John chapter 4. We're going to start off in verse 6. Amen. When you get there, saints... Here's the deal is, Sister Alberta, I'm really sorry for this. 
But you're going to have to take this up with the Father. Um, like we're, we're, for the most part, an unchurched people. Like, and that's why, like, even as I stopped and we redid the song, like, here's the thing, like, me and Nicole are still learning how to work to each, with each other. But I want, like, I, I want Sister Sandy to understand, like, hey, this is, you know, I want her to start to understand that some songs we sing to, to, to the atmosphere and those songs are important, making those declarations. And then there are songs that we sing to each other. I want, you know, Brother Jack to understand. I want, you know, Sister, Brother Joseph back there to understand. I want everybody to understand. So that's why I said it. And then that's, I want you to understand, like, what's stirring my heart? What's, what, what should be stirring us up? So I, I share things like that. And then I, I really feel like the Lord broke in in an even greater way when we sang it again. It was a blessing. I, here's the deal. Like, did you appreciate that? You had better say yes. But you better tell the truth, more importantly. But, and that's why I do things like that. Because I want us to understand, and even, you know, talking about Kronos and Kairos. Because there may be a time where I just say Kairos and I don't give it a definition. But I want to teach us, I want us to understand who we are as a, as a young church and many unchurched people. And many people that have even, you know, maybe we had some churching back then, but it didn't quite fit. But now I believe the Lord is touching every single one of our hearts. And where we would have never cared about what the Greeks said before. Now we can kind of get excited and get stirred about the difference between the two different Greek words for time. Or now we can get excited about what Jesus is saying as we read John chapter 4. Is everybody at verse 6? Praise God. He's up there. <coughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him this is a Kairos word. That means it's for right now. Tell him. All right. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Everybody knows Jesus is the Son of God. Are we all in agreement there? Come on. Amen. Don't, I could have Dave take you in the back if you disagree. <laughs> Praise God. Actually, it wouldn't be Dave. It would be his son Joseph, and he'll get you right. <laughs> you might catch his left. But check this out. So Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey... Sat thus by the well. Here's the thing. Jesus is tired. Jesus is weary. It's just he's tired. And he sits by the well. I want you to see something. Something you need to pick up immediately as we step into this Kairos word for tonight. Jesus being wearied shows us that we are entering into a story that is talking about that, that for one reason or another, the importance of Jesus' bodily condition is stated. Do you get that? The, the, the Jesus' bodily condition is being talked about here. In other words, they're talking about Jesus and how he feels. For the kids, he, they're talking about how Jesus feels. And it's important that we understand how Jesus feels. I'm not talking about his heart feelings. But he was in his body. The condition of his body is that he was weary. There, so it's important. The Holy Spirit doesn't add things for just no reason. It's there for a purpose. Because we need to have our eyes awakened to the fact. That this story has also to do. With the fact of Jesus' bodily condition. Or in this time. In this moment that we live in. In this night that we're in. The condition of the body of Christ. Anyone here part of the body of Christ? Come on. Next verse tells us, A woman from Samar of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. He didn't ask this only because of his need, but also as a way to get to her need. As we come to Christ, it is often our needs that bring us to him, that lead us to him, and I found most often that his response to our encounters with him is not only the gift of salvation that we receive, but the call to satisfy the needs of Christ, or like I say, in this time, the needs of the body of Christ. Did you? Are you with me in that? Amen. 
See, here's the thing is she bumps into Jesus at the well. Why? Because she's thirsty. She has need. She has flocks or whoever her, her, her husband is or her master is or whatever at this point. She has a need that takes her to the well. She obviously doesn't have a problem going to the well to get her needs satisfied. But the issue arises when she bumps into Jesus and Jesus tells her, give me a drink. And like I said, a lot of times I find that when we encounter the Lord, we come to him and we're like, hey, well, well, I'll get there. But we come to Jesus because of our circumstances and things that have led us there. Because of our needs. And sometimes here's the deal. and I'm going to be real with you. And this is where it's difficult being a pastor or even a leader in the church is because as we deal with people and as you're going to be dealing. Here's the thing. For one, you're going to recognize that some of these things have been you. And I want you to learn that that's fine. But I want you to learn that this is going to be the call that God has on your life also. You're going to start to see as we minister to more people that people are going to do this with you. So it's important that you get corrected here. You learn from it here and then you grow. So that way, you, you know, you don't have to deal with it as long. <coughs> but like I said. The call to these encounters with Christ are often mixed with the call to satisfy the needs of Christ or the needs of his body. I apologize deeply for that. <clears throat> I can't get too excited tonight. But it says he was weary, in, which is his bodily condition representing the condition of his body. We all have what the groundwork I'm laying right here, right? Are you with me? Yeah. Verse 8 says, For his disciples had gone away, gone away into the city to buy food. So in other words... This lady was led to Jesus. Here's the thing. She has a need and Jesus is about to get to that need. Jesus is about to get to the heart of the situation with her. But the first thing Jesus does is call upon her. Why does Jesus call upon her? Because he's, he's an he's a, he's a impoverished, needy. No. It's actually for her good. But he calls upon her. He says, give me a drink. And then we see the... And then the Holy Spirit through the scripture here, it gives us... The reason why it says for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Here's the thing, because those that had been ministering to Jesus, they were busy doing things that needed to be being done. Do you, does that make sense to you? The disciples, the faithful, the ones that normally would have gotten Jesus water at that time, they were busy doing what needed to be done. Verse nine. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Check this out. The first response of this woman is her problem with traditions and how she's been treated through history. How she had been treated by religious leaders. How she had been treated by the church. Huh? How she had been treated by them other Christians. By the, and she says by the other Jews. That's how her people were treated by Jews. But it's in that same way. Look at her and Jesus. I, I mean, they're in the same conversation. But as you begin to read this story, as we go through this tonight, I, I sometimes I was studying this. I was like, does this lady like she does not even get it. And sometimes I'm like that with some of you as as we go through things. And as you go through things, and I'll tell you what, a, a lot of it is with some of the people that are not even here tonight that are supposed to be a part of this body. You know, they leave and they let things go and they think I don't care about what's going on. But my son said something to me yesterday I said brother you've got to have compassion he said Jesus was moved with compassion when people had faith Amen. and I told him to shut up quit talking truth no I'm just kidding no that's the truth Jesus was moved with compassion when people had faith this lady needed to get some water. As you're going to see in a little bit, this lady probably had obligations. She probably was not getting water for her own good only, but for a household or for something more, for, for higher authority maybe. And Jesus very simply responds, give me a drink. And the first thing, here's the thing, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Alpha Omega, God of all creation. Give me a drink. Do you not wish that it would be that easy for you to just like Jesus? Here's the thing. We all would 
most of us would say, hey, I want to do something for Jesus. Don't you wish it was something that easy? Like, give me a drink. Like, I got two bottles of water down here, Lord. Which one do you want? Or perhaps I go get you the cold one. I've got some Pepsi. <laughs> like, don't you wish it was that easy what the Lord was asking of you? But see, here's the deal. Many of the things that the Lord is asking from you, they're not that hard for Him. Just as easy as you could get Him a drink, He can change your circumstances. He can change your situations. But this woman, her first response is, most Jews don't even have nothing to do with me. Why would you? It's Again, it's the offense. It's the hurt. You don't even know my, you, you know my history and my history's not good and no, no, no. And this and that, my past and blah, 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 blah. God has done a background check and he knows who he's encountering. He knows who he's encountering. Is that proper English? No, I lost it a minute ago. Verse 10, and Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's like, if you would stop hardening your heart when I speak, if you would just have a little compassion, if you would again be vulnerable. I was dealing with another minister buddy of mine. who Actually, we were dealing with each other. And we're crying and this and that back and forth. And it's like, hey, bro, I'll never let people hurt me again. No, they'll never hurt us again. And finally the Lord dealt with me and I told him, brother, you know what? <laughs> the reason we're ministers and we're, we're called and we're effective and God's blessed with us is because we are vulnerable. And we're going to be vulnerable again. We're hurt right now. And I can't imagine how I'm going to be vulnerable again, just like you can. But we're going to be vulnerable again. And that's, that's this lady's problem. She refuses to be vulnerable when it comes to Jesus. She refuses to be vulnerable when it comes to her Savior. She, she doesn't quite realize who this is and Jesus confronts that. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says, this to you, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here's the thing, by this time Jesus had been out performing miracles. Word had already gotten around to certain places about Jesus. But she was so worried about her own little microcosm and her own little situation. And the devil used that Proverb 18.1 uh, 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 trick against her. Proverbs 18.1 says, anyone that isolates themselves seeks their own desire and refuses all wise counsel. And she let that happen to her. She doesn't even realize that this dude has been going around and has done some things already. I'm not sure what all he has done up until this point, but this is not his first encounter with anyone. And he tells her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you a drink. But her response was the, how, how she was treated. Her response was unbelief. With his reply, he's, getting to, he's trying to get her to focus on who he is. Many that come to Christ want him to do what they want, not paying attention or giving excuse why they won't do what he wants. Do you get what I'm saying tonight? Am I st are you still with me? I did, this, is, this is a short sermon. We're, we're getting close to halfway. We're getting close to a third of the way. I just got started. And the woman said, I'm in verse 11. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Then she goes on. Let's check out verse 12 before I start talking about these two verses. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? So first she says, you don't even have nothing to draw with. Where do you get living water? Next she says, are you greater than Jacob? Are you greater than the tradition? Are you greater than the thing that's happened to me? Are you greater than my problem? Because remember, her problem is tradition. I'm talking a little bit fast, but I, I love this word tonight. Basically, she goes back to the tradition. Here's the thing. Her problem was tradition, but what does she go back to? She goes back to her tradition, which was that Jacob had given this well. And then what does she do? She points her finger. Well, you don't even got nothing to do. How are you going to get living water? You don't even got nothing to get water with. And you know what? This is a picture of some of us when we get to the church. We start to talk about what we need. 
Pastor, I need someone to pay my rent. I need my Excel bill paid. I need this. I don't even have my kids and I don't have this. You know, and, and I hear so many things that go on. Or maybe it's just, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated. Or maybe it's just I'm hurt. But everybody, many of us come with excuses to the church of why we can't fully surrender to Jesus. Why we can't let Jesus be Jesus. And Jesus from the very beginning of this parable, remember, it's a parable that gives us insight into helping the condition of Jesus' bodily state. His bodily state is he was weary. And she wants to point out the problem with Jesus and his body. Well, you're worried because you don't got no water because you don't got no way to get no water. How many people you know that when you invite them to church, their problem with the church is the church. They start pointing at the people in the church. Here's the thing. Tell them, remind them. I'm not trying to get you to come to church so that you can get all churchy. I'm trying to get you to come to church because when the saints gather in the name of Jesus, Jesus shows up and does things. And it don't matter if he has a ladle or a bucket, but he has living water that he's willing to pour out. He has a reason, a plan, and a purpose. He is a healer. He knows what has happened to you. He's done a background check. He's calling you. You, but you're letting tradition, you're letting offense, you're letting the things that have happened and the things you can't explain overcome your need for healing. Here's the thing, you can explain to me all your problems, explain to me all your situations, and you let that explain you out of your blessing. Saints. <coughs> She points to the fact that he can't even draw water himself. You got problems. How are you going to do something for me? You got problems. Here's the thing, saints. Even as here's the deal. No matter what you're going through, you're going to see problems in this church. If we were to shrink, you'd see problems. As we are going to grow, you're going to see problems. But instead of focusing on the problem, let's focus on the one that wants to speak to you through the problem. Let's focus on, instead of focusing on, on what is missing, on what is lacking, let's start to speak to the one who can provide and supply what is missing and what is lacking. And let's look, start to focus on the one who can supply in the midst of impossibility. See, we want things our way. Well, if, if, you know what? If, if my need gets ministered to, I am going to be such a holy Christian. I am going to, oh, I, you don't even know. Once I beat this case, I am going to go be on fire for God. And I will never uh, beat another man again. And I will, you know, and that's what Sister Papoofy says. She says, and I will, you know, I will go forward. And then she beats the case. And then six months later, Pastor, I found a guy. And he loves God. Oh, he doesn't go to, you know, and then it starts over. I don't know where I was going with that. But this is the problem. That's right. As we take our eyes off the one, that's right. we start to put our eyes on the problem. That's what this sister's doing. She's at the well with Jesus. Again, the word of Jesus, the, the, the rumors, the, 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 the gossip, even the stories of what he's done. They've got to be greatly magnified in that area, but she's in such an isolated situation that she encounters a Jesus that has a bodily need and literally she can help out. But all she wants to give is excuses. And here's the thing, all through this, I, heard, I mean, they're obviously in the same conversation, but they are on completely different levels. And sometimes that's how I end up getting. And it's not because... I don't want to minister to the needs of people, but many times I don't have, I have what you truly need, not what you think you need. And it's not because I'm so holy, it's because the one that, the one that put me in your path, he's the one that supplies my every need. So if I don't have what you think you need, but if you're certain he put you in my path, trust that I've got what you need. Does that make sense to anybody tonight? Here's the thing. He directed our steps. He brought us all together. He's done this. I don't doubt that at all. And I may not have what you think you need. 
But I guarantee He has given me what you require for life. What you need to get going. What you need to keep going. What you need to keep living. Her response points back to the issues of Christ or back to the body like many do. When confronted, they point back to the church. John chapter 4 and verse 13, here we are. And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. So that's just like sister so-and-so. Sister Papoofy beats her domestic violence case. Sister Papoofy's going to message me on Facebook tonight. She beats her domestic violence case and then six months later, oh, I love him. His eyes are black, Pastor. That should be a sign to you, Sister No, it's angelic, yeah, right. He has a tattoo of the Santa Maria right here, you know. There's always a reason, though. He's a pastor, I was so stressed. Jack's over there laughing, he's got that tattoo right there. Uh, praise God, I love you, Brother Jack. He got it before he got saved. <laughs> pastor, you don't know, I, I was doing so good, and I just slipped a little bit, I just I smoked a little weed. And I got the weed pills now, but I'm, I'm going to quit soon. And that's Jesus. Here's the thing that, that confirms Jesus' response in 413. Whoever drinks of this water, in other words, whoever gets their need met their way, is going to thirst again. Drink a whole bucket of that water. You and your camels, and you're going to need more of it, lady. Let this church pay your rent this month. It's going to come back again. I will tell you something. Every family, every hotel room, every Excel bill that we have paid, I've had the blessing and the opportunity of being able to pay it again. Did you, did you catch that? And it's not to say that I won't help you and that we're not here for you. There are times when we have and there are times when we haven't been able to. But that's so true. Whoever drinks of this natural water, you're going to thirst again. Until you begin to deal with the spiritual situations, the spiritual condition. Then, you will be made whole. We can't be these and then Christians. Oh, once the Lord, you know, once I, you know, here's the thing, Antonio, I'm going to tell you something, bro. You're ready to preach now. The Lord's going to do so much more than teach you about preaching and, and putting you through Bible college. You know what? You're going to be learning as you fill out the paperwork, as you do this, as you do that. You're going to, so much of it is going to be a training ground. And so little of that is going to be associated with teaching you how to preach. I'm sure when you first thought about Bible college, you were like, oh, they're going to teach me how to be holy and how to preach. Really, how much do you learn about preaching? And Well, I know you learn about being holy through the school, but you know, you get what I'm saying though, huh? How much of it really happens in class time? And how much more of it happens when you're preparing for class? When you're praying? When you're getting ready for class? When you're getting ready for the semester, the trimester, whatever it is? In your job, Sister Deanna. When we get these new positions. The Lord is preparing you through those things. Here's the thing. You're not going to reach a pinnacle where one day. You're going to just all of a sudden be committed and be spiritual. If you keep waiting for that day to come, you're going to end up like sister right here at the well. Where Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. You may get briefly satisfied, but you're going to thirst again. And he says this, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. In other words, when you start to drink from me, when you start to partake in what I care about, when you start to receive me, you're going to have water that's going to flow out. And that's really what you need to be doing. And the word said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. What does she want? Well, I'm good with that easy way. And he tells her, I'm glad you asked. He doesn't use those words, but it. I can could, I could see Jesus saying, all right, here we go. And he addresses the problem in her life. 
<coughs> in this time, a husband to a woman was recovering. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. He said, go, call your husband and come here. In other words, go get your covering and come here. Because here's the deal. When God is really pouring out blessing, everything is done decently and in order. In Psalm 133, I think I pointed this out a few months, a few weeks ago. In Psalm 133, it talks about the anointing that flows from the head to the beard onto the clothing, the priestly clothing. That's in Psalm 133. Why? Because the anointing and the blessing that is that is that can maintain and that can stay comes from the top. I, I when I minister to families, I very I, I the best thing I can do for your family is minister to your husband, minister to the head of your household. My I have a family member. She used to get mad at me. She used to say, "Well, why do you always talk to him? I'm the one that's related to you." And I would say, "Because if I teach him right, and he receives it and he walks that out, that's your blessing. Amen. I am certain that God will bless you if I deal with this one." The husband. And in that same way, Jesus is saying, you know what? I'll, I'll bless you. You want the living water. You want the truth. You want to never thirst. You want. Then let's deal with the situation. First of all, he says, then go call your husband because the blessing comes. The anointing comes through the order that God has ordained. Now, if there's any sister in here and you're having an issue and your husband doesn't want to serve God, just keep being faithful because I got a scripture for you. I'll share it with you after after service. But there comes a time when God wants to get things in order in your life. Amen. And she was out of order, not because of victimization. She was out of order because of her choice. There's a big difference. Are you with me, saints? She wasn't just all bad luck, hard luck, and she fell out of order. This was her continued pattern in life to be out of order. Watch, we're going somewhere. Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered. Are we at verse 17? I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have, you have well said I have no husband. Next verse. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. She had no covering. And even the covering she was trying to work with right now wasn't real. When I first got this message, it was deep when I was realizing that this was a message about the body of Christ. And then it goes deeper right here. Because saints, I'm here to remind you that the church is your covering. The people that tell you you don't need a church to serve God, they don't know how to serve God. That's right. You need to understand that Jesus loves, how much does Jesus love the church? The scripture says that he loves the church so much that he sacrificed himself for her. The scripture teaches us that we are the body of Christ and that we are the bride of Christ. That, we, that Jesus will return for a bride without spot or blemish. That Paul says, I have betrothed you. In other words, I have raised you up as a, an amazing church to present you to Jesus. So anybody that tells you you don't need a church to serve God, you know what? They don't know what they're talking about. Look at the fruit in their life. Look what they're doing. How many souls they win and how much impact are they having? And this is where it's so important. Look at what she has done. Jesus tells her, you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not even your husband. In that you spoke truly. Why? Because she kept throwing off her covering. Christians, I am here to tell you tonight, you cannot continue to serve God and time and time again throw off your covering. Keep going to new church and new church and new church. Here's the thing, if they're not preaching the gospel where you've been, then you need to get the heck out of there. But if you're, once you're planted 
in this place. This is not a place that you should bounce out of. When it's time for you to go, I will be the last one that holds you back. But I want to send you out with peace and with joy. Yes, there may be some tears, but not with anger and frustration locking the door behind you and filing a restraining order. When I send you out, it's going to be with peace. It's going to be with a blessing. It's going to be with the anointing and everything that God ever gave you in this place. But this woman kept throwing off her covering five times. <coughs> People that church hop. They will hop and they will go and they will hop and they will go. And they will be somewhere. And most of them will tell you, I'm trying out this place now. I, I deal with it. I'm trying, they, they, you know what I mean? They're, once they've done it like the third and the fourth time, they'll tell you, oh, the Lord dealt with me about getting back to church. So I'm trying out this place now. I don't know if that's my church yet. You've been there six months. You better start giving. You better start doing something. <laughs> but I was going to go try your church. Don't do me any favors. And, and, and here's the thing. I know we all have different circumstances, but I'm telling you something. That it is very important that you plant where God has called you to plant. Amen. That you follow through where God has called you to follow through at. That you be the person that God has called you to be in the place that God has called you to be. Remember this woman, what does she say? She's like, you don't even got nothing to get water with. How you give me living water? Amen. Pointing back the problems of the body of Christ. She says, well, why would you even have anything to do with me? Your traditions say you wouldn't have nothing to do with me. And then her defense after a while is, or her, her, her uh, kind of even the sideways attack to Jesus is about the traditions. On one, she's offended by traditions. On the other, she's standing on the traditions. Do you see how wishy-washy someone gets when they're not rooted and grounded, when they're not planted in the body, firmly planted in the body? And look at, and the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 20 says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. So she goes back. She's like, and I, I don't even know how to... Here's the thing. You know what I've heard from people? One young lady in particular. Well, this is just too hard. I just don't get it. You know why? Because she doesn't want to quit the sin that she's in. And it breaks my heart. And I pray for her to this moment. And I'm going to pray for her tonight. And I'm going to pray for her tomorrow. My wife will as well. And that's what this lady comes, oh, it's just so hard. Other people around here say we should worship here. This is the only place there is to worship. But the Jews over there, the lady, Jesus just told you, if you would discern who is talking to you, you were just amazed at the prophetic gifting that he had. But you're still all caught up in the, in the nonsense. And Jesus finally, as he, we wrap up this service, Jesus says to her, woman, woman, believe me already. I actually, I am a very holy man and I speak mostly King James in my household and I have told my wife those words often. Woman, thou shalt believe with thine, or something like that. No, believe me, he says. The hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. And what does that next verse say? You worship what you do not know. We, wor we know what we worship for. Salvation is of the Jews. Next verse. But the hour is coming and when? Now. Now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You know what? Here's the thing. The church doesn't save you. Jesus saves us. But when you're really saved, you become part of Him. You become part of the body. Why? Here's the thing. How many of you have fancy cars, 
but never put gas in them because gas is offensive. It stinks and it could catch fire and that one time it splashed in my eye and it cost four bucks a gallon. Like, so I won't ever put gas in that car because I love the gas, I love the car. Isn't, isn't that stupid? But people, oh, I love Jesus, but I will not set foot in a church because it is offensive and it is. Here's the thing. Without the gas, that car is useless. I won't say it's you, your Christianity is useless, but I'm going to ask you this. How effective is your Christianity? How effective is your faith apart from the body of Christ? How effective are you just wiggling there, little toe? Or maybe you are the very important heart. But how effective are you just wiggling there? Look at this. Check this out. You know what this is? The hour is coming and now is. Do you know what that now is? That's Cairo's time. That's a now time. You know what, saints? I'm telling you, God is doing something. Me and my wife have been going through some, some intensity at the house. Intensity, here's the thing. is I, I'm going to tell you something. Our lives do not separate. We, we live down the street over here, for those of you that know. And, and then, but our lives, like, you would think this is just like, there's just a walkway from our front room to this place. Because we don't separate our lives from what goes on here. And you know what? There's been some intense battle against us. But I'm very excited about what God is doing. And getting encouragement from the body is what has kept me going. And you know what? You can sit here and point out the things we don't have. You can point out the, you know, I don't know. Is it hot in here or is it me? Oh, okay. I, and that's why I look at Alberta. No, you can turn it down, Dave. You can turn it off now, bro. We'll save the money now. Alberta's approved it. No. But I want you to understand the importance of you being connected here. And you know what? For the people that are supposed to be connected here, I'm telling you right now, as you watch this, you need to get back. There's no good reason for you to be out there alone. This is a people that loves you. And then if you're mad at me, if you're mad at my wife, if you're mad at my, my, the doorkeeper, then get here and let God deal with us. Yeah. If you get mad at me, let, then let's hash it out. I'll tell you what, I have issues with the body of Christ. And sometimes it gets too hard. I can get what this woman's saying. She said, well, they say to worship over here, and then, but they say to worship over here, and I just want to worship, but she really doesn't want to worship. She just wants to make excuses. I've been in this. Me and brothers have had discussions back and forth, scriptures back and forth. Can't stand each other, and we got eight more hours in the car. But at that, we still need each other, not just because we're in the same car. But we talk after the car ride, too. Because the Lord deals with us. It's very important. Saints, it's very important that you get your healing, your wholeness, your wellness, your identity from this body. But don't think you're going to do it by neglecting the needs of of this body. Here's the deal. If you will just do your part. God will fill in the gaps. Some of our gaps have not been gotten. Because somebody's waiting for all the gap to be filled to right here. And then they'll extend their hand. Do you get that picture? We're like oh no but there's a gap Lord. We need this filled. And then you want to get right here. And the Lord's waiting for you to. No you know what I'm going to stretch a little bit. I'm willing to sp spread myself a little bit and try to fill this gap. And then all of a sudden the Lord fills it. Check this out. When both times when the miracle of the feedings happened, Jesus gave thanks for the, for the, for the loaves and the fish. Both times. You're, you read this in the Bible. God's word. Jesus gives thanks for the fish. 
gives the same amount that he gave thanks for that was given to him, gives that back. So they, here's the thing. Peter still just got a piece of a loaf to feed thousands. Pay attention, saints. And Peter had to start giving to the people before it multiplied. It says he never ran out of bread. The disciples never ran out of fish. They, they ended up having extra. But Jesus didn't give thanks and then poof. Jesus gave thanks, gave it back to them, and they started to fill in the gaps. They started to fill in the gaps. And next thing you know, like probably the fifth time, the loaf just wouldn't get smaller. Peter started getting excited. Pastor Robert Morris tells that story the best. I love the way he tells it. That's why I keep bringing up Peter. He badmouths Brother Peter. Do I got to call Peter pastor? Because he's like my authority. Uh, anyway. We'll discuss that in eternity. But Peter, not Paul, but the other disciples, they had to actually give out for the loaves and the fish to be multiplied. It didn't just happen. Jesus didn't say, thank you, abracadabra, thank you, Father. And then, no. They just each got, each got a little bit and had to start giving out, had to start filling in those gaps. And it's in that same way Jesus that lady stumbles across Jesus at the well in John chapter 4 and she says, you know, Jesus says, give me a drink. And right away she just answers back with all these problems, all these natural situations that she has. And you know what we learned from that story, like I just said, I'm almost done tonight. Is that, you know what, this is where you get your wholeness, this is where you get your healing, your identity, this is where you get your f fulfilled, this is where you learn the purpose that God has for your life. But don't think you're going to get that without ministering to the bodily needs of Christ. And this church is part of that bodily needs, and I'm not speaking this tonight just because you people have been so bad about that. I'm speaking this tonight because we need to be aware. Like, I don't want you to miss out. Here's the thing, when the, I can keep going and going. When medical doctors, they, you know, they perform surgeries. Well, how do you do open heart surgery? Well, you open the chest and you clip, 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 snip, 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 you know. But I'm sure there's some things that if you, for, well, you, I, obviously there's some things that if you don't clap this off in the right order, you ain't going to have no the live person or no live heart no more. You'll lose it. And I don't want you to lose the blessing that God has for you, saints. I want you to understand why God is going to bless this place. Because we are getting things in order. And here's the deal. And so with that, in Jesus calling you to get things in order, don't be like this woman and just be so offended and so ready just to have a response. Like that's not that's not reasonable. From here's the thing: you're you're, you're shutting off the supernatural that's trying to speak into your life. So with that, I'm going to ask Sister Nicole to come up tonight and. You know what, saints, I just want to ask you to come up tonight and to begin as we worship and as we enter into the presence in an even greater way right now. You know what, you've got to encounter the love of God to have an unoffendable heart. Like, I could just imagine, just, here's the thing, because I've experienced the way Jesus loves me. And I'm going to tell you something. I've been able to look at people and shake their hand and just let them know I love them. And that it's different than any love they've ever experienced. So I could imagine if God can do that through me, that God sitting at the side of a well could just look. And penetrate me. Furthermore, you know what his word says? His word says his eyes are like a flaming fire. That means he can like look to the depths of your soul. So if God could do that, I can imagine he's doing that with that woman. Say, mija. And she's just tripping. You got nothing to drink with. 
Your people been bad to me. All this, all that, the attitude, the excuses, the nonsense. With Jesus just looking at her saying, I love you. With his eyes. Trying to teach her and all of us a spiritual lesson. Go ahead and kill the Saints, I'm going to invite you to come forward tonight. And right now, the first thing I pray over the saints of Jesus in this place, over the church of Jesus Christ in this place, is I break the power of every negative thought. Claire's many times.